so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Open Wallet Foundation project proposal process. Um, I guess, you know, is, are people here familiar with contributing code to open source and everything? I, I know some people are, but, you know, we'll go over everything in some detail today. And please feel free to ask if you have questions. So let's get started. Um, so before we really talk about the mechanics of contribution, I would like to emphasize, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Why should you contribute to the Open Wallet Foundation? Um, you know, the OWF is a consortium of companies and organizations that are looking to drive adoption of, you know, open and secure digital wallet solutions. So the OWF is, you know, an open source foundation. It is not a single wallet. It is a wallet engine. It is a set of wallet components that you can use to build a digital wallet. Um, and I want to emphasize uh, that the open wallet is explicitly neutral. So one thing I always emphasize when I talk about open wallet or most Linux foundation projects for that matter is the technical community is 100% open. So it's never pay to play within the open wallet foundation. You can always participate as an individual, an employee uh, of a company or, or a corporate member, but the technical side of participation is completely open. Anyone can contribute. Anyone can start a project, anyone can lead a project, everything is open. So when people ask, should I contribute? I usually provide the following fundamental question. You know, do you want to develop collaboratively in the open on wallets and wallet technology? And if the answer is yes, then I certainly think you should contribute to the Open Wallet Foundation. This fundamental question or fundamental problem is really what the Open Wallet Foundation was designed to solve. Um, we get frequently a few questions from people asking about contributing to the Open Wallet Foundation. One of them is, what if I don't have any collaborators yet? What if I'm looking to work in the open and looking to work with other people, but I don't know who I want to work with yet, or, or maybe you know I don't know who's interested? Um, I often encourage people and say that contributing is a great way to find co collaborators. Um, if you show people what you're doing in the open, it's a fantastic way. People will often come out of the woodwork. You'll have people who you had no idea who are working on the same thing or something similar. Um, and I will say our labs organization is specifically designed to be a place where companies or, or individuals or, or really anyone can contribute and, and show off code to others to try to kickstart full projects and find collaborators. Another question that sometimes gets asked is, do I lose control of my project if I contribute? And this is not the case at all. We ensure that projects starting in the OWF transition really seamlessly from their old homes into the, one, uh, the Open Wallet Foundation. So the maintainers, the contributors, the governance start off essentially the same. Um, and as, as more contributors can come along, you know, these things can change. But, you know, if you have a huge influx of people working on your project, uh, we think this is a great thing. Um, and we also can ensure that when you contribute a project, you can write a project charter to make sure that your projects will remain focused on their original missions. So what kinds of code should be contributed? So we get all the time people ask, you know, what is, what is in scope of Open Wallet? You know, there's a ton of things in scope of the Open Wallet Foundation. Here I've just listed, you know, some of the things that the uh, Open Wallet Foundation architecture group has listed uh, as, as things they're interested in. And, and this is really not an inclusive list. And what types of wallets? You know, there are many different wallets people want to consider working on. You know, native wallets, web wallets. Um, you know, we have a ton of people who are very active in the digital identity community, some of whom I'm looking at right now. Um, and this is another uh, hot topic. And as we go forward, you know, we expect that even things like MPC wallets or other wallets that, you know, use advanced cryptography uh, will also become popular. So really, there's a very broad scope for the OWF. So let's get in now with this background in mind to how the project lifecycle process and how projects actually are proposed at the OWF. So projects begin uh, with a proposal 
uh, that must you know, be accepted by the Technical Advisory Council. And this isn't usually, a, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a PhD defense or an interrogation. Uh, it's an opportunity instead usually to present your work to the community and hopefully encourage other people to contribute or join your effort. And we have three main stages of projects in the Open Wallet Foundation. There are labs, which are things that are starting off, right? So this is you know, early or experimental code, um, or people looking to start collaborative development. People who want to show their code, you know, say, hey, I want to get in start, I want to get started, I want to do open development, you know, here's what I've got, come join me. Then we have the growth stage. And the growth stage is really for projects that are looking to, you know, as the name indicates, grow. So this is for projects that really want to get more diverse contributors, you know, add more maintainers, uh, and really expand their footprint. And finally, we have a mature project lifecycle status called impact. And this is for projects that are, you know, popular, have a big development community, have diverse maintainers, and long-term support. And then, you know, because not every project is successful, and, and we want to celebrate this, and we want people to be okay with this. Um, and we do have a project status called Emeritus, which is for projects that are sort of, you know, finished or uh, the maintainers feel are, are reaching the end of their life. And I do want to emphasize that this is a natural part of the open source life cycle. Um, as, as Jim Zemlin will tell you, there are really only one or two projects that have defied sort of gravity uh, in open source. And this is a natural thing. Um, so as I sort of sketched out earlier, the project acceptance process is, is really quite simple. Uh, it involves filling out some documentation uh, and then presenting a proposal to the TAC. And the TAC presentation is really more about telling everyone in the community what you're doing and looking for contributors. Um, and I will say also that the TAC uh, will determine the appropriate initial stage of the project, but projects can ask the TAC, uh, they can suggest which stage that they think they should begin in. So, you know, <laughs> the proposal is, it is really easy. This, this is everything you have to say, basically. You know, it, it will take less than an hour if your project code is already open sourced. Um, I'm not gonna read through everything here, uh, obviously, but you know, I, I just want to put this up there to emphasize that it is very, very simple and quite straightforward to contribute a project. Um, going a little bit more in more detail to some of the life cycles. Uh, so this is the life cycle stage for labs. Uh, so this is the most basic and simple um, project status. Uh, you know, and it's really easy. You can contribute and submit in a lab in a half an hour. And we really want people to contribute their experimental coding efforts to labs so that we can help foster collaboration. Um, you know, we don't necessarily encourage people to use labs in production, although, you know, certainly across the LF, we see people that uh, maybe do do that. Um, but, you know, labs are reviewed on an, on an annual basis. And again, labs are explicitly for experimentation. So, you know, we don't necessarily provide like CICD support, uh, you know, security, uh, bug bounty programs or um, audits for labs programs. So growth status means that a project really wants to grow and move forward. And the requirements are a little bit more explicit. Uh, I, you know, don't necessarily want to go through all of those, but you can see them for yourself. Um, we do generally expect projects in the growth stage to move out to impact status within two years, or perhaps move on to, to other projects and, and become emeritus. Um, we recognize that this doesn't always happen. Uh, and depending on their plans, you know, projects may move around in a number of different directions. And finally, there's the impact stage of the project life cycle. Um, we expect impact projects to, you know, have a big participation in the foundation, 
have a diverse membership. Um, we expect these projects to be used, you know, they are sort of the final form of open wallet software. And as such, we expect diverse contributors. Um, we like to use the metric of if one company or one core individual went away, would the project continue seamlessly, right? You know, this is really important in open source. Uh, and that's what we expect from the impact lifecycle stage. Uh, and finally, there's the emeritus stage. And I wanna emphasize that, you know, projects do end. It happens, you know, for many for good reasons. Um, and uh, it's also notable that emeritus projects can be reactivated. Uh, and this hasn't happened yet in the Open Wallet Foundation, but we have seen this happen in other sister foundations in the Linux Foundation. Um, yeah, and I'll just put up some links in here. Uh, I'm sure you'll see these throughout the day, uh, but we would certainly encourage people to get involved on mailing lists, on our Discord, which is extremely active, uh, and check out our, our GitHub and uh, everything else. So thanks. Um, and I guess I'm out of time, so I will pause for any questions, either in person or, if possible, remote. Yes. Um, so I will ask a question somebody asked me, and I'll probably, you know, basically they are groups who are currently not member yet, they are trying to find out, but they are working on code uh, in this space, identity, and mm -hmm. also So yeah, I mean, practically we encourage people to speak with members in the community. So, you know, if they know people in the community to talk to people they know, if they don't know anyone to ask. Um, personally, I think Discord is a great place to ask. Um, that's where I would recommend people to go because I think you get the fastest time there. Uh, we seem to have people moving away from email lists, uh, which, which is great, but you know. Um, so yeah, I'd say get involved in the community, come to the TAC meetings, come to the architecture meetings. You know, you don't have to talk in the meetings. You know, we're not going to interrogate you. Lurking is definitely okay. Um, but I would encourage people to, to join the community um, and talk to people and then if, if they're comfortable to contribute. And I also think contributing is a great way to get involved in the community and to make a splash because it shows other people what you're doing, right? You say, hey, this is what we're doing. Is anyone else doing something similar? And then that's a great way to foster collaboration. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, thanks, and I'll turn it back over to Torsten.